a lot of um, inbound customer service and related uh, functions for, for banks, hotels, airlines, uh, and, and uh, outsourced um, contact center, customer service type operations. That was in the 90s. It's grown ever since uh, into multiple industries and different strategic focus areas. But we, of course, do retain that, that time zone advantage, which is nice for being able to do business across the Americas as well as in Europe in the same business day. When we really looked at our, uh, you know, strategy um, going forward, we we launched a 2020-2021 strategy that focuses on some some core strategies and industry sectors that uh, are supported by those. And I'd just like to step through those a little bit and 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 outline three of those core strategies. The first of which is connecting businesses. So of course we have this. Um, makeup where we're a tight agile network we have great you know information and communications technology infrastructure uh great uh, logistics and transportation networks um and we have strong supply chains and market access you know export to us is a necessity it's always been a new brunswick focus um you know we, we punch above our weight class for for export uh it, you know it's the u.s market obviously is, is attractive but also to other jurisdictions in canada and to europe and the caribbean and, and others um, so we're really looking at those supply chains and connecting businesses um, to really leverage the strength of our tight network here in new brunswick and i'll, I'll comment a little bit more about uh, an example of that later Another is growing through technology. So we set metrics, KPIs around productivity improvement, and really uh, a key way of getting there is through is through technology adoption and, and really encouraging that and growing those kind of global leaders that uh, we have in the province. You know, we're we're fortunate to have companies. Everybody's heard of the Irving Group companies and uh, Cook Aquaculture, McCain Foods International. These companies have, you know grown their presence in New Brunswick from a New Brunswick base and our global leaders, you know, multi-billion dollar companies. And there are very specific reasons for why they choose to continue to grow in New Brunswick and why other companies uh, come here to be part of, you know, the ecosystem and supply chain and collaborators uh, within, you know, different uh, industry sectors with, with some anchors uh, like that. And a third big strategy area is attracting emerging sectors and growing ecosystems where we do have existing strengths. Uh, so each one of these kind of indicates uh, the three of these uh, emerging sectors that we have a, a big focus on uh, for specific reasons. Business services centers, I talked a little bit about already. Uh, that's a, we call it a more of a traditional and mature one where it has evolved uh, to where it's the high value functions within companies that re are retained in New Brunswick. Um, so those are good paying jobs with, uh, um, you know, a big economic impact on the province every year. Um, employees, 18, 19,000 people here um, across industry sector focus areas. Um, another one would be agritech. Uh, so, you know, with companies like McCain, uh, for example, uh, you will have technology companies that are looking at uh, optimizing yield and, and uh, mitigating uh, pestilence and that sort of thing. Um, so that's a big focus area for us and, and a bit more of a traditional growth area as well as advanced manufacturing. Uh, those, those, those are key staples of our economy. The three newer emerging sectors that we have a lot of traction and assets in include energy innovation, cybersecurity, and digital health. So I'd like to talk a little bit, just a snippet on each of those. Um, New Brunswick is, is uh, the epicenter for cybersecurity in Canada, and we can point to a lot of things. We can point to um, University of New Brunswick, for example, having you know, the first faculty of computer science in the country, and then developing a, an information security center of excellence here. Uh, launching companies out of programming, and even attracting the world's uh, biggest, like IBM, uh, which acquired a company here back in 2011. And now IBM's um, worldwide has nine CTOs that all report to Fredericton, New Brunswick, uh, as their global cybersecurity headquarters. Similarly, Siemens has their um, 
Cybersecurity Center of uh, Competence here in New Brunswick. Uh, and there are a number of other assets. And we have K to 12 education. I mean, we like to say that uh, cybersecurity is part of our society, uh, you know, from cradle to grave. We're really focused on, you know, even my own children are exposed uh, you know, throughout their grade schooling to cybersecurity initiatives. And of course, it's translated into our post-secondary. So we're really focused on that workforce and, and, and growing that ecosystem. Um, critical infrastructure is a big focus area for us, uh, protecting the electrical grid, uh, healthcare systems, education, those sorts of things. So there's a whole um, you know, security operations center or critical infrastructure SOC that's focused on that and a, a, a new uh, a new building actually coming uh, that that is uh, supportive of all these uh, these pillars within cybersecurity. This building here actually will open this fall, uh, and it's the only you know level two security building east of Montreal. Uh, there are contracts that you have to be in a building like this in order to bid on. Um, so it, you, know, you can imagine that there will be a mix of uh, government, uh, academia, and, and of course industry uh, in, in a facility like this. It's a 135,000 square foot building up in our Knowledge Park in Fredericton, the capital city. And digital health, another area. And you know, it doesn't take uh, long to realize that each of these emerging areas has an uh, an incredible amount of overlap. So security in healthcare, for example, or critical infrastructure security for energy innovation and the smart grid. Uh, those, those are big uh, Venn diagrams with a significant amount of overlap here in the province. So when we talk about digital health innovation, uh, we can point to a really strong infrastructure, a really strong ecosystem where we have closer to 55, 60 companies that are here that are either homegrown New Brunswick companies or multinationals with a component of their work being done in digital health here in the province or other FDI companies that we have uh, from outside the region that, that are here doing work. Um, we have a number of stakeholder groups. It's not just government, but there are other associations uh, and organizations that are focused on digital health. And, you know, we have a very, uh, very tight network of, of communication between all of these stakeholders, companies, and network partners that extend even outside into Brunswick and around the world. Um, and we, we, within all this, we have a number of, of projects or, or key initiatives that involve, you know, ecosystem partners like some of the ones that you can see on, on this slide here, but also ones that involve um, partners that could be pan-Canadian or even uh, from outside of, of the country. Um, and I'll point to some, uh, some stars, I guess, amongst that. Uh, there is a, a project called Can Health uh, that it, where New Brunswick will be the Atlantic hub uh, for that pan-Canadian network that will really foster innovation across the country in, in digital health adoption. The goal being, you know, innovate here, export everywhere. Uh, you know, we want to have uh, a soft landing for companies that want to, you know, play in our sandbox for, for digital health innovation and we can connect them into the network uh, that way. And all these projects have some element of that. Um, we have a, a health and technology district project where that replicates a model that exists uh, across the country in British Columbia. We have an MOU with that organization and our, uh, the second site for a health and technology district will be in St. John, New Brunswick, uh, here in the province. We also have companies that combine, or sorry, projects like Healthy at Home, which combine uh, 5G and rural connectivity with delivering healthcare uh, in the home. Uh, so we have a number of uh, New Brunswick companies and, and entities, as well as uh, um, some, some investment attraction uh, targets that we're working with to, uh, to work with some telecom providers and others on, on that project. And then there are a number, number of other ones. You know, we, the federal government has even seen how New Brunswick is unique uh, in, in really representing a microcosm of Canada um, with our, our demographics surrounding whether it's aging or chronic disease or uh, indigenous, French, English, uh, rural, urban. We have the makeup that looks like Canada, but we're big enough to matter, small enough to be nimble to be able to uh, basically be the, uh, the the living lab for digital health innovation in the country. So it's a great place if 
you know, companies are looking for a, a partner, uh, a collaborator, or looking to, you know, for the next country for adoption, New Brunswick could be a great place to start for a Canadian or, or a North American strategy. Similar things could be said within the energy innovation uh, strategic uh, focus area. And there's a bit of history here that it sounds familiar in that uh, it's the experience in digital health and, and cybersecurity are, are uh, there's a lot of crossover. Um, when we talk about energy innovation, I guess the best way to, to think about this is New Brunswick has a very diverse you know, energy generation uh, makeup. So, you know, we have hydro, nuclear, um, you know, solar, you know, and we have fossil fuel, wind. So, and we have one uh, Crown Corporation uh, power utility um, that, you know, has a 330,000 meter base and, you know, so it's, it's sizable. Um, and that is really attractive. It's, it's another living lab essentially. So along comes Siemens, uh, years ago and saw this, you know, diverse generation, um, you know, less red tape, having a, having a utility that could be worked with and some others like St. John Energy and, and others that also could, could, you know, play nice with others. Uh, a university uh, post-secondary network that's really, um, really progressive in this area. Uh, and, and really, you know, Sparks flew, uh, you know, literally and figuratively in, in really adopting a lot of smart grid technology uh, and using New Brunswick as the model for that uh, and, and, and exporting that uh, worldwide. It developed ultimately into, you know, some really, really valuable assets like the smart grid innovation network where University of New Brunswick has, you know, a, a product modeling or, you know, conceptualization lab uh, to prove an idea for energy innovation. And then Siemens has an, another lab within that network, an interoperability lab to see how it will perform on the energy grid combined with other you know, demand response systems and other technology in, in that industry. And then NB Power, the utility itself, has their lab, which really focuses on the commercialization of, of, uh, you know, of product development uh, within that cycle. So a really collaborative uh, example uh, of and success here uh, in New Brunswick in this area. Um, it, clean energy and storage, you know, big focus on renewables, of course. I talked a little bit about smart grid and, and uh, efficiency optimization of the grid. Um, that critical infrastructure element, of course, that uh, has a lot of crossover with our cybersecurity ecosystem. And the whole engineering and support services around this, uh, this is big business for us. Um, so we continue to focus on that as a strategic focus area. Underlying these strategic pillars, there really are these, or so these strategic focus areas, we really focus on four uh, key areas. And in, we consider these pillars, uh, and I alluded to each of them as we went through this uh, presentation, um, and, and what is it that makes New Brunswick unique? And if you talk to companies like the Cook Aquacultures or the, uh, the, you know, the Irving companies or, or McCain Foods International, or you talk to, you know, Siemens and IBM and Salesforce and CGI, and then, you know, these companies that have been here for, for a long time and continue to grow, they'll point to elements within each of these pillars. People will, they'll say it's, it's the people, it's the, uh, the workforce growth, industry awareness, stakeholder alignment, you know, it's, it's, our, it's our network of people that, you know, we're essentially no more than two degrees of separation away from anybody in the province that's going to be able to help uh, support your business growth. Um, you know, whether that's a public official uh, in government or, or it's somebody within our, you know, academic sphere or, or another industry collaborator, uh, people within Opportunity New Brunswick and our partners, you know, we're, we're directly connected in, into that ecosystem. Uh, also, innovation. You know, a lot of R&D work done in New Brunswick, a lot of uh, utilization of New Brunswick as, uh, you know, that Petri dish, that microcosm, test market, call it what you want. Um, you know, innovation lives here and uh, it can be seen uh, very, very tangibly, uh, as can infrastructure. So, we, we showed you the cyber center that's opening this fall. There are also uh, digital health infrastructure. We have a New Brunswick Center for Precision Medicine, uh, Center for Healthy Aging. Uh, we have the Health and Technology District that'll be on the campus in uh, the UNB campus in, in St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, 
collaboration, collision space, uh, access to infrastructure, uh, you know, our, our electrical grid being one, uh, and, and buildings and other physical infrastructure another. And our agility. Again, our size is an advantage here. Uh, we, we recognize that. We take a leadership role in talking about that. We're on top of global trends and market intelligence to, to really uh, utilize our, our size to our advantage and our agility as a, as a, as a real value prop that uh, companies can point to in, in helping them to grow their, their operations. And before I say any more and before we take on questions, I really want to have uh, Suzanne Trammell, uh, Director of Export uh, Development at, at OMB, talk a little bit about how we help companies uh, on the trade side. And, and then after Suzanne, we'll have Dan Martin uh, talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, workforce strategy, immigration, client engagement, that sort of thing. So I'll hand it over to you, Suzanne. Yes, thanks very much. Is this sound okay? Loud and clear. Perfect. Um, so yes, good morning, good afternoon. Um, it's wonderful to join you for this overview about New Brunswick. As Joel was mentioning, um, we are focused on creating a greater, larger trading environment for New Brunswick's economy. And this is how we, we, we deem economic growth to happen, at least from amongst the domestic firms. So important to note that when companies, when foreign companies do come to New Brunswick to establish a footprint, um, the export vision carries through to all companies that are resident in the province. And so that means you become part of our family of global traders or global exporters. So I'll speak a wee bit about that um, in a second in terms of what that means for support and the way that Opportunities New Brunswick can help you. Um, but just to provide some context into our um, trading expertise, if you will, New Brunswick is, New Br uh, is Canada's most trade reliant province. And we say that because nearly three quarters of our GDP comes from our trading activities. Um, and we've been trading with Europe in particular for hundreds of years. So we understand how to trade. Um, and while we're small, as Joel mentioned, less than a million people here, we have a very diverse group of companies that are trading or that are exporting outside of the country. There's almost 800 companies that are very experienced traders and we're selling around the world to about 150 different countries. So that provides some context, I hope, in terms of New Brunswick's trading reputation and experiences. Um, before COVID, our trade figures were on a wonderful trajectory up with exports growing around the $13 billion mark. Um, and we saw actually increases in the number of companies that were trading internationally, 7% in the last five years. So as everybody, we are watching for the effects of COVID, but we do hope that our trading experience carries us through and that next year we participate in what we're hoping to be a sizable global rebound. Um, so our top markets are the US, it's next door, it's very logical. Um, some countries in Asia, Western Europe in particular, and some of the Caribbean islands. So when it comes to Europe, Western Europe, we're very focused on the UK and France and Germany and Netherlands and Belgium. And we're watching our exports grow in fact to other places like Poland and Ireland amongst others. So it's great timing that we're speaking with you today. Um, so back to what we do. And with that context in mind, with our priority markets, OMB's objective is to grow the number of companies that are exporting and to continue to help our companies diversify their markets. So with 90% of our export volume going to the south of us, which means the United States, we have a lot of work to do to increase the non-US portion of our exports from 10%. We have a lot of companies diversified already, but we want to see more companies exporting to more countries 
but more importantly, exporting more to more countries, if that makes sense. So we do that with the team within export development that works hand in hand with you, should you be here, um, or the rest of the New Brunswick based companies on their export visions. We counsel on export strategy and market entry approaches, on logistics, on product positioning, on the competitive nature of your goods or services. We also like most government organizations organize a variety of outbound trade activity, trade missions. We go to trade shows, we have New Brunswick pavilions. We work very closely with our colleagues in the other three Atlantic provinces, as Joel mentioned, in Atlantic Canada. When we pool our resources, we have more numbers and greater chance for success by achieving economies of scale by working together. So we run a lot of projects as Atlantic Canada going into market with trade missions, with lead generation programs, or at some of the marquee industry trade shows. Um, finally, and just a word, since COVID, as many government organizations have had to do, and as many um, support agencies have had to do, we have pivoted to a completely virtual environment. This webinar is one example. We will run trade missions virtually, we will participate in trade shows virtually, and we will organize trade shows virtually. And there's a lot of work for companies to get ready to do business virtually. So we have been spending a lot of our time since April on training our companies to be better at selling, better at presenting in this new online or virtual trade world, as we call it. I would like to point out a very exciting project we have planning right now, and it will be our first trade mission, virtual trade mission, focusing on um, France. And so we will be reaching out to partners in France to let them know to please come to visit New Brunswick companies in our virtual trade mission where they can meet with our New Brunswick companies who are interested in finding new partners in France. There are many more initiatives um, underway and I would be very happy to share with you our vision, our strategy and some specific activities with respect to the European market um, if you would like to have that discussion with me, with Europe being our second most important trading region in the world, it is becoming focus number one for us in this post-COVID world of virtual trade. So thank you very much, Joel, for the opportunity to speak with your guests today. And I'll stay on in case there are some questions at the end. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, interesting and and got me thinking about some of the relationships that I've been fortunate to develop over the years and and uh, always have an affinity to work with people in Ukraine. Uh, I realized that uh, the Chamber of Commerce there is uh, active within this organization and, and uh, one of my favorite places in the world. So uh, another one to add where there's a lot of interest and a lot of activity uh, on the export side as well as with the uh, investment attraction side. So, I, and, and Dan can even speak to immigration examples as well, um, right. you know, w with respect to Ukraine. Um, COVID too being a talking point, of course, it's on everyone's mind. Um, we are we are fortunate in, in a number of ways in, in New Brunswick uh, and, and including Atlantic Canada in that, in that we were able to kind of curtail things on the, on the first wave to a degree that allowed us to, you know, embrace this virtual world, work from home, because we're ideally, you know, with our with our um, information and communication technology infrastructure, the transition to a work from home model was was uh, relatively painless here. Um, a lot of our offices have opened back up, you know, and retail sectors have, have opened up. And we, you know, in the summer, July 3rd, opened up what was called the Atlantic bubble. So there's free movement within the Atlantic provinces. Um, so, so all of these things combined, it, it, it helps our exporters, um, you know, in, in having less uh, interruption, given the times that we live in. Uh, it's also attractive for companies that, you know, do need to grow uh, and want to be able to support employees anywhere in any location. And, and that can be attractive for, for doing that in New Brunswick because of the, uh, the remote uh, work, you know, 
possibility here uh, versus some other places that it's a, a little bit harder to make that transition. Mm -hmm. and, and the cost, the cost structures and other supporting elements that uh, and quality of life that sort of feed into that uh, and really making those value props for, for those types of decisions. Anyway, I'll stop rambling on that and, and I'd like to uh, transition to my colleague Dan Martin who will talk a little bit more about uh, immigration and, and uh, the future citizens of New Brunswick. Great, thank you, Joel. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Delphine. Um, very, very happy and excited to be able to, to speak with you all today. Um, appreciate everyone's time. Um, I think that we've covered a lot and I, I hope we're making a compelling case for why New Brunswick is such a great place to do business. Uh, certainly I'm biased, but I do think it's a pretty, a pretty fantastic place to be from a business standpoint, but it also shouldn't be lost on um, any of our, our, our uh, participants here today that there's a real advantage when it comes to the quality of life and quality of people that we have here in New Brunswick. Um, speaking quality of life, I can say that that personally, uh, I woke up this morning in, in my home, uh, was able to drop my two daughters at daycare and make my way to the office in about a round trip of about 10 minutes. Um, and so that I think is a major advantage if you're in a large center where you might be a little frustrated with commute times uh, and, and the like. Um, and quality of people, uh, je pense que c'est très très important de noter aujourd'hui que nous sommes la seule province au Canada uh, qui est complètement bilingue. Um, in New Brunswick, you're going to find a variety of people, uh, les personnes qui parlent soit le français uniquement, soit l'anglais uniquement, who are qui sont bilingue, uh, and that gives us a real advantage when it comes to servicing clients um, on a on a European stage uh, for the rest of Canada, the rest of North America. And so, um, as we continue these discussions, and and we hopefully get to know some of you, we'll want to talk to you a bit about quality of life, quality of people, quality of workforce available uh, here in New Brunswick. So to, to Joel's earlier point, uh, so, so my name is Dan Martin. I'm, I'm typically the manager of our, manager of our client engagement team uh, at Opportunities New Brunswick. I'm currently on a government secondment with the Population Growth Division of the Government of New Brunswick. And as I was preparing to speak with you all today, I thought, what better way to really show that New Brunswick is open for business uh, and, and excited about immigration and bringing in new citizens than by pointing out that I'm actually working for a department called population growth division. So completely dedicated and completely focused on uh, growing our economy and the size and diversity of our population. Um, so within this assignment, I have specifically been leading the entrepreneurial immigration stream, which I will touch on briefly uh, here a little bit later this morning, but also wanted to outline some of the different ways that we are inviting both companies and individuals uh, to immigrate to our province uh, to contribute to our economy and again to grow and diversify our population base. Uh, and, and I should note as well as a general rule, uh, the team that I'm working with now are in place specifically to demystify some of the things that may uh, typically be part of the immigration process. Uh, immigration is complex on its best day, but we have a team here that's um, looking to guide, looking to take away um, barriers that, that you may find in other immigration programs within different provinces, different jurisdictions in the world. Um, we have a team dedicated to that, that sort of one-on-one -on -one help and counseling to make sure that uh, our clients and in interested individuals are here to support you at, at all levels. With that said, a brief overview on a number of the programs that we have um, designed to bring people to New Brunswick. Uh, the, Atlantic, excuse me, the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program, or the AIPP, uh, that was developed for New Brunswick specific um, employers to hire foreign skilled workers and recent grads who want to live and work in New Brunswick. However, um, by entering into an agreement with Opportunities New Brunswick and working with our support, uh, we're able to fast track a designation for um, a foreign organization that has set up shop in New Brunswick who want to access that particular way of hiring international talent. Um, so that's specifically available to clients of ours. If you're new to doing business in New Brunswick, you can still access that program, which is a very quick and efficient way to, uh, to bring talent. Um, I'm going to note a lot of these immigration programs here today because depending on the size and scope of the organization that you're currently working with, uh, we encourage you to, uh, to bring some of your workers with you to New Brunswick when you set up uh, the organization or, or the um, subsidiary here in the province. 
uh, whether that's to build and sustain culture um, or to bring over some top talent that you think would be important on the ground in, uh, in North America. Uh, we are very big proponents, very big aides in making sure that um, if you want to bring some of your great people from your current location to New Brunswick, we're, we're here to help with that. Uh, the New Brunswick Skilled Worker Stream, that's designed for foreign nationals who possess the skills, the education, and the work experience needed to contribute to the economy here. Um, once you establish your organization in New Brunswick, candid candidates can be brought in to New Brunswick with genuine offers of employment, um, as long as they're looking to reside and, uh, and work in New Brunswick. That's, that's the real key here. Uh, we want these people to come and stay and be supported, and we have many programs in place to do that. Uh, the ex express entry stream is designed for foreign nationals with the skills, education, and work experience uh, to live and work in New Brunswick, um, but are on under a certain NOC code. So we have um, occupational codes um, that would would be um, would have to adhere to that particular program, but uh, with the right supports and the right um, connections here in New Brunswick, we can help you to understand exactly how that works. Uh, the New Brunswick Strategic Initiative. Uh, alors, designé spe spécifiquement pour les uh, travailleurs francophones, les citoyens qui veulent venir au Nouveau-Brunswick uh, pour établir leur résidence permanente. Um, but, but we, as I've said earlier, um, we're a bilingual province. We have a bilingual workforce, um, and we are always looking to bolster that and increase with our francophone population. So we have a stream that's specifically dedicated to uh, bringing over um, French-speaking workers. And then finally, the, the stream that I'm currently leading on behalf of the province, um, the entrepreneurial stream, so obviously designed more so for um, a small scale business that wants to grow and expand into the North American market, um, provided a certain level of language, education, uh, net worth verific verification. This is a way to gain permanent residency in Canada. Uh, while achieving your, your entrepreneurial goals and entrepreneurial dreams. Um, I'm happy to discuss that one at length at any point. Uh, we are trying to really streamline the process to make that as efficient as possible because as I said, New Brunswick is very much open for business and looking to uh, ensure that entrepreneurs and businesses of all size that want to come to the province are not caught up in red tape and, um, uh, and, and having to complete thousands of forms. Uh, we certainly have due diligence that we need to, to take care of, um, but a, a team in place to really ensure that that's as painless as possible. Uh, Joel, just the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're very much open for business. We have very successfully na navigated COVID-19 uh, and we are operating as normally as just about anywhere in the world. Uh, Joel alluded to that earlier, but we are able to travel within the four Atlantic provinces. So Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, uh, it's opened up uh, the, our, our entire region, which from a peace of mind, a mental health, a productivity, a business standpoint has, has been absolutely incredible. Um, and, and it's advanced even beyond other regions in Canada. So we're quite proud of that. Um, and it's something that is aided by um, sort of the, 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 the quality of people we have here, but also by the space that we have in New Brunswick. We're not as congested in, in deep downtown cores uh, as some of the other uh, larger centers all over the world. Um, and that, that gives us a, a lot of quality of life advantages. And specifically given the current climate, uh, we've been able to retain as much uh, normalcy as, as one could hope for. Um, so we want you to know that we're here to, to, to support you. I, 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 when I'm back at ONB in, in uh, the reasonable future, uh, I'm, I'm part of the client engagement team, which is the team dedicated to all of the things outside of um, you know, the financial and, and pure business arrangements that you'll be looking to set up in New Brunswick. It's absolutely critical that you've got community support here from our team and all of our partners, be that at the uh, academic level, be that at the economic development, multiple levels of government, community support, settlement support. Uh, we're going to make sure that you feel welcome in our province, you feel supported, and you know that you've made the right choice. Uh, I think that we can show that we have hundreds if not thousands of businesses that have grown, prospered, major international brands all over uh, New Brunswick here. And uh, we, we would like to say that we've had a little hand in helping many of them and, and would love to, um, to, to do the same with, with some of you from uh, all over the European Union. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure here to be able to speak with you this morning. We hope that this is just the start of a dialogue between Joel, myself, Suzanne, uh, and, and all of you. And I know that our contact information will be available at the end here. Uh, we would love to carry on 
with questions and, uh, and, and please contact us directly on LinkedIn, um, via email, however you see fit, so that we can uh, tell you more about New Brunswick and, and learn more about you. So Delphine, with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Merci à toi et à tous ici ce matin. Uh, je vous souhaite une bonne journée et merci pour votre, uh, votre participation et votre attention. Thank you very much, uh, Joël, Suzanne, and Dan. It was uh, very interesting to, to see the, what New Brings Week uh, can offer. Um, I think we had one question, but Suzanne uh, already answered, so that's, uh, so that's great. Um, I personally have uh, just a few questions, so maybe it, it, it can be more um, a little bit detailed for, for our audience. I have maybe, yeah, let's say two questions maybe one for Suzanne on the trade side. So with which country do you trade the most? And I mean, from Europe, of course. <laughs> and, uh, in which uh, sector of activity? So you can give us a kind of, uh, you know, overview of, of uh, who you are working with. Yes, sure. Merci pour la question. Thank you for that question. Um, and my apologies before I lost my function, so I couldn't turn my video on. No problem. After having bragged when we practiced that I know how to do on and off video. So as I mentioned, so our, our top country, of course, is the United States. But heading into Europe, which is our third most important um, region in the world for trading, um, the UK, France, Germany, Belgium remain our top countries in terms of dollar value and so we can't ignore that you know those are priority priority markets but as Joel has said a reference rather we do have companies that are interested in trading in the not so obvious priority markets in Europe um, and for us, so that's Poland and perhaps Ireland and the Ukraine and some Scandinavian countries. Um, and so while they don't figure in, you know, maybe the top 10 from a trade data perspective, they are of interest to, um, to a variety of our, of our exporting firms. Um, and about that, so our leading export course is energy. But when we subtract our energy exports, we have a very vibrant trading community among the entire seafood and fishery sector, um, among our lumber, with three quarters of our province being rural. Um, we have a lot of lumber and value-added wood products that we have been trading overseas, especially into Europe for 200 years. So anything that's value-added wood and then anything that's in that building product and construction product sector um, is very important to us and especially important to us in Europe. And you're looking at um, not only raw lumber, but you could be looking at doors and door frames and windows and hardwood flooring, etc. cetera. Um, to the technology sectors and Joel's presentation spoke about our our priorities are growing our digital health and cybersecurity and, and some other tech sectors. We have wonderful companies um, that are global traders now in those spaces in cybersecurity and digital health, um, along with the rest of the, the normal technology sectors that would be prevalent across Europe, in fact. So we see a lot of similarity with our clean energy and our clean tech sectors, our cyber sectors and digital health. And so we'll be looking at prioritizing trading opportunities for companies that are in those sectors. In addition to what Joel's work would be doing is attracting companies um, in those sectors to become part of New Brunswick ecosystem in, in those industries. Um, food, you know, the whole food manufacturing industry is huge in this province. I will say since COVID, there's less of attention, less of an interest on international markets as Canadians, like other regions in the world, are shoring up local supply chains. But nonetheless, food companies very interested in expanding their offerings across Europe and across the United States um, and even into Asia markets like Vietnam and Malaysia and South Korea, for example, are popping up in, in terms of interest and numbers. Um, so food industries, everything from maple syrup to spices to bread products, 
um, in addition to a very thriving seafood industry. And you know Atlantic Canada for our seafood and for our lobster. And most of the lobster is coming out of Nova Scotia or New Brunswick waters. Um, but that's not our focus at Opportunities New Brunswick. Our focus at Opportunities New Brunswick is on the non resource exports. So anything that's value add, additional processing that's being done to those products, that's our focus. So hopefully that gives you a sense of a nice, well-rounded and diverse trading culture with hundreds of companies in a variety of different industries that are, that are currently actually trading around the world. Okay, thank you, Susan. And before we actually move to my next question, maybe for, for Drill, I have a question in the Q&A section. Which sectors have seen the advances in trade you are seeing currently with Poland and Ireland? Uh, there is an initiative with CDN trade offices in Warsaw to go fisheries export, for example. Mm, that's a great question. So I don't have the trade data memorized, um, but I do know for Poland in particular, there has been over the past, I would say pre-COVID, so the past year, there was more interest in looking at Poland um, as a landing pad into the rest of Europe. So we have a committee of food, um, food industry experts and government experts that work in the food sector that were looking at opportunities across Europe and really trying to figure out this place that Poland could offer in terms of not only serving that market, but jumping off into other European countries. So, so I think that that interest continues while we had to slow down a wee bit in the winter time with, with some of those plans. We do have an exciting trade project um, taking place at the end of November where food buyers, food importers, food wholesalers in particular are welcome to come on to our virtual um, food and beverage trade mission and we're also looking concurrently at having um, samples in market and tasting opportunities in market if we with some logistics issues this week to work out um, but if all goes well you can have a virtual meeting with those companies while you're tasting or while the chef is preparing the project so we cross our fingers that we can sort out some logistics in in the next month but that's very much on the radar and, and Poland is very much on the radar, especially for the food industry. I'm not aware um, if we have that kind of interest or determined um, effort, if you will, for other sectors. But um, thank you for that question. It's a, it was a very interesting angle that came at us last year that caused us to pause and really reflect. So maybe there's more to our trade than just Western Europe, right? Um, I would say too, Suzanne, yeah. from, a, from a tech sector perspective, you know, there have been some interesting uh, developments, you know, in, in, throughout the pandemic where we've seen companies that may have had a, uh, you know, industrial focus that have transitioned or at least yeah. added to some of their capability um, through yeah. COVID-19. And that's opening up export opportunities for them. Uh, I'll give two examples. One, you know, a company called Lumen Ultra uh, that, you know, focused on water testing technology that was readily uh, adaptable to uh, immunological type testing. So they've developed a COVID-19 test uh, that resulted in a million orders for test kits uh, from the government of Canada. So those sorts of success stories are opening up lots of export opportunities as well. Another one, uh, a Microsoft HoloLens partner called Cognitive Spark, uh, provides mixed reality solutions for helping um, in the field for technicians to be able to uh, address, you know, maintenance or repair operations, for example, with a remote expert, just like they're sitting on their shoulder. Uh, and it's a low bandwidth solution, doesn't require more than about a two bars of, uh, uh, you know, 3G on your phone or one bar even yeah. um, to, to be able to have that work. Well, this is a, a great solution for, uh, you know, remote guidance for, uh, you know, administration of, of health services. So um, they, you know, they were already going down that path. Uh, this just opened up even more, uh, you know, so in addition to working with, uh, you know, militaries around the world, for example, or, uh, you know, instru you know, 
almost a 3D virtual reality training solution for aircraft or oil and gas. They've also added even more in in the uh, in the health field uh, th through uh, COVID-19. So you know, Cognitive Spark, Lumen Ultra, those are companies to watch, I guess, on a you know global export uh, scale. Yeah, that's a great segue. We had about 30 companies that pivoted um, very, very early on, and many of those companies were already current and active, we'll call them global traders, like the two that um, Joel had mentioned. And so that has opened up a whole new industry, if you will. And in fact, we're speaking with very preliminary conversations with our Atlantic Canadian colleagues and our federal government colleagues in terms of how do we now look at the, these PPE suppliers, if you will, as, as a larger industry? Um, of course, shoring up domestic supply is priority, but there will be global trade opportunities in this PPE business. And what does that look like from a trade, you know, trade support perspective? So I think there's going to be some really exciting things coming down, um, coming down the pipeline with respect to promoting Canadian made, very high quality um, PPE um, supplies to the rest of the world. And again, Europe is a huge, huge interest to us. So of course we would be looking at what those opportunities are in Europe in particular. We have one company, um, in fact, that's very seriously looking at um, selling their PPE products across the UK. Thank you. We have another question on trade before we move to, to another question is, do you see any trade flows with uh, Spain? Ah, uh, yes, we love Spain. Um, we do. Spain is interested in our, again, our food products and in our seafood products. Um, we see that there can be more opportunities, but we do have to study that. We had hoped to get into Spain, um, along with revisiting the Netherlands, um, Belgium, France, and Germany this past spring, but alas, we were not able to travel. Um, so yes, Barbara, you're asking that question. I would love to speak with you privately afterwards and we can talk about what your perceptions are um, with the Spanish market, but it's definitely on the radar to explore further and beyond the, the food industry in particular. Great. We there, there was a question, uh, Delphine, I think about uh, specific skill sets yes, as well. Exactly. I was um, about to ask. <laughs> yeah. I can, you know, I can speak, uh, Dan, Dan's got a lot he could say on this. I know I'll, I'll point to a couple of examples in the tech sector. Um, of course, cybersecurity, um, you know, is a, is a, a very broad term, but it's certainly something that's incorporated within, as I mentioned, our K-12 education system and, and throughout our uh, post-secondary institutions as well. So to try to help meet, you know, local and global demand for, for those types of skill sets going into the future. Uh, also, we have a really, uh, you know, beyond, you know, a customer service and export mentality and, and uh, bilingual uh, capabilities. Um, if you want to get more granular, uh, it, within the tech sector, there is a preponderance of uh, social media analytics and uh, data analytics type capability here. Um, there's a history. Uh, there is a homegrown company here that was acquired by Salesforce. So salesforce.com has, uh, has an operation, uh, actually two sites in New Brunswick. Um, and that has actually attracted its own little mini ecosystem of, of companies companies that uh, want to be close um, because of the talent uh, within that uh, within that area so it's that's a that's a bit of a niche one but uh, certainly if you're looking to get granular that'd be one I could point to with social media analytics uh, but Dan uh, you, you must have lots of great examples yeah so so it can be a you know a bit of a regional question by times as well depending on where you would want to be in the province um, we have a number of major centers, and, and the, the, the disparity of um, of skills can can differ by market. Um, what I would say, as a broad statement, is one thing that we're incredibly lucky and incredibly uh, reliant on is our, our our academic system and our educational partners. We have a two tiered uh, system of um, post secondary education, so our college system and our university systems, who are incredibly responsive to the needs of our clients. Um, and so if uh, we realize that perhaps there are talent bases that are required by our 
client companies that have not traditionally been in uh, the particular market or region that you as the company would like to like to explore, uh, we can within a day set up a meeting with our college and, and university partners to talk about building programs um, in order to build that pipeline for talent in the future. Um, and that coupled with our immigration programs and the ease of use for those immigration programs, we rely um, on, on the talent that's here and, and it's, it's multifaceted and diverse, but also um, we're focused on building that talent pipeline for the future as well. So it's, it's something that we really engage in and really are committed to when we talk to uh, um, companies on an international stage. Okay, thank you. There was also a question on Denmark, but uh, Suzanne already answered. And yes, again, to all the participants, anyway, you will receive by the end of the day or tomorrow the presentation with uh, Joelle, Suzanne, and Dan's contacts. So um, yeah, again, the, the, the target of this webinar is really to have an introduction and then you can contact them for, for further projects. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions before we, we actually end this webinar or if uh, you want to say any final words, Joel, Suzanne or, or Dan, before, yeah, before we, we end this. Just that it's been a pleasure and we appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, we have a, a little joke about maritime modesty uh, and it's a Canadian thing, but uh, we're proud um, of New Brunswick and, and uh, we're very business oriented, export oriented, investment attraction oriented. Um, you know, we we want to continue to build these types of relationships. So we appreciate the opportunity that you provided, Delphine, to be able to speak to this audience and uh, look forward to connecting later. Great. Oui, merci beaucoup. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everyone. Since there's no other questions, uh, I think we will end up, uh, we'll end it here. And again, yeah, you will receive the presentation, so you will have everybody's contact, don't worry. And also don't forget to sign up for our next edition, which is next week, which is uh, Nova Scotia. And thank you again to our three speakers of the day, Joel, Suzanne, and Dan. Have a great day or great afternoon, everyone, and we'll connect next week again. Merci. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you.